All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks for joining me today. My name is Jen Kellogg, and this is the first in my Concert Business Basics workshop, virtual, work, uh, virtual workshop series. Um, while I've done a number of workshops like this, uh, this is my first time doing a virtual one on Zoom and doing it a webinar style. So thanks for joining me on it. And um, yeah, we're going to get started. So a little bit about me and how, uh, oh, I'm sorry, the first thing I wanted to do was talk about who this is aimed at. So I envision this being a workshop series for people that are getting started in their career um, or maybe know a lot about their specific role and want to learn more about how it fits into the bigger picture of what's going on. Um, I know when I started out, it was a while before I got in my career before I discovered that a manager is different than a tour manager. And there just hadn't been a reason for that to ever kind of come up. And I remember thinking like, I wish I had had a reason to be told this information kind of upfront. So I find a lot of times you don't know what you don't know. And so my aim for this is to kind of fill in those gaps. And especially for people that want to expand their career, a lot of times we're wearing more than one hat if we are out on the road. A lot of times the tour manager is also doing merchandise or doing sound. Um, so kind of expanding our knowledge base so that we can wear more than one hat um, in our jobs is kind of one of the goals that I'm trying to accomplish here. So today we're just going to do an overview of how an idea becomes a show and it kind of is the foundation for all the things that we're going to talk about in the future. So we'll get very into the details next session on the deal structures for artist performance fees um, and we'll talk a lot about beyond that routing and venues, different jobs and careers. Uh, we've got a whole lineup of topics. So um, this is gonna kind of give a context for where those bits fit in um, when we talk about those more detailed portions. A little bit about me, for those of you that don't know me, I know a lot of you from the Warp Tour, I think, or from my time working um, at Columbia College Chicago. I have a lot of uh, students that I think are rejoining in on this. Um, I started my career at Jam Productions in Chicago. I worked in the accounting office there for a while um, and spent some of my free time learning the production side of things and ended up becoming a talent buyer. And at that time, we I was on a talent buying team where we bought for theaters, arenas, and a lot of minor league baseball parks. So my time at the promoter, I got the opportunity to work on everything from small club shows to large stadium shows. What I really loved doing was being on the road, on a tour bus for two months, um, and being on site at the shows every day and working on a large long-term project like a tour. So I left the talent buying job to be a freelance tour accountant, um, and that landed me with the Vans Warp Tour where I was the tour accountant for from 2009 through 2017, I want to say. During that time, had some kids um, and wasn't looking for full-time road work and landed in the, off, the warped off season. Uh, I started teaching at Columbia College Chicago where I teach producing and touring live entertainment, which is a thing that I'm still doing. So that kind of started my love of teaching and education and bringing you know, my knowledge for uh, about this industry to kind of like the next generation of the industry. So that evolved into here we are today. Um, the workshop series will be me doing some lecture style stuff, but I'm also going to, as it makes sense, bring in special guests and um, speakers that are really experts in their area and are really living the real world experience of whatever topic that we are on. Um, you can find the full lineup of what's coming up at jenkellogg.com and I'll be adding on to that. I'm planning on having like at least the next week or two of workshops uh, announced on that. So once I've got this first one done, I'm going to figure out what are all the ones coming uh, a few weeks down the road. So we're going to jump right into the presentation for today. If you can, during the presentation, use the Q&A function to ask questions. But I want to let you know that when I'm doing the presentation, I'm not able to see that Q&A box. So uh, also for continuity's sake, I'm going to go through and do the whole presentation. And then if you have any, uh, it will then be able to close the presentation, be able to then see the Q&A and kind of address any of your questions. 
Um, so please ask questions in that Q&A if you can, and I will get to them as soon as like the full presentation is over. Another thing I want to mention is during the presentation, there are a couple of short videos. The playback isn't amazing going through the Zoom webinar, but it's good enough for the functions of what we're doing. On my website, I will also have a link to the presentation that you can just click through without having to like, you can go at your own speed and click through it if you want to go back and watch the videos with uh, better sound quality. Um, and those videos, special thanks to all of the people who five or so years ago were willing to get filmed and um, ended up in these videos. When we were doing it, it was all kind of related to the Warp Tour. So, um, while we did our best to kind of have a diverse lineup of people, um, I will say like the selection of people that are in the videos is very much the people that were kind of like tied into the Warp Tour world at the time. Um, and I thank them all for participating and, uh, and joining us on that. Uh, and it's really been uh, useful to have these little video parts to be able to kind of tell the story. So um, jumping into the presentation, I'm gonna share my screen and you will be able to hear me, but not see me. Um, hold on, I wanna make it so that you don't see my video. And here we go. Um, all right, so how an idea becomes a tour. As we're kind of going through this, um, oh, I guess I'm going to mention that in a second. So we're going to start. We're, we're going to start with an idea. And we're going to follow the evolution of how that idea results in a tour. This idea can, uh, it, could, it can be small and it could be a solo singer songwriter who is playing in their own space and they do all of the roles um, that encompass this journey. But as the shows get bigger, the jobs become more numerous. And if we're looking at something like a giant rock band playing arenas, everybody's job becomes more specialized. So I want you to know that this is kind of a generalization of the roles that people have on this journey. And um, it, it, sometimes people wear more than one hat. So as we go through this, just know that everything in theory could be kind of done by one person. And the larger the show, the more people that are involved. Um, while we're looking through this, there's two kind of sections uh, the two sides that are working together. There's the producer side and there's the promoter side. So if you kind of see on this timeline, the things that are on top as we go through this will be the things that the producer is working on uh, and involved with. And the things that are on the bottom part of the timeline will be things that the promoters are working on and involved with. So the first thing that we need is a tour uh, or a, the producer needs to come up with an idea. Um, the producer, a lot of times, will usually call this person the artist or the band. Uh, if you're in the theatrical world, the title producer is much more accurate. But whoever is creating the artistic vision for what ha is happening on the stage is who is on that producer side. And while we say that it is the, the artist or the band, they're going to have a whole team of people that are facilitating this happening. Um, on the promoter side, while the producer has the artistic vision for what's happening on the stage and like the big picture of what the tour is going to be and look like when we're looking at the stage, on the promoter side, that is the entity who is going to take the financial risk on a particular show, or maybe they're buying the tour and taking the risk on a full tour. They're going to contract with the artist and the venue to bring the artist and the venue and that date together for the show to actually happen. They're going to advertise the show, make tickets available uh, to the public for sale, and they're going to provide any of the local production requirements. So these lines have gotten more blurred as promoters are buying full tours and having ideas that function as like the producer idea of what's happening on the stage. But traditionally a promoter is taking care of these things 
and the the artist the producer is having the financial or not the the artistic vision and bringing that vision to life on the stage the promoter is bringing that performance to a local audience so we've got an idea Let's, we're going to use a, a fictional example of some real world, with some real world names, just so we all kind of have the same kind of context. Let's pretend we've got a band like Green Day that wants to do a giant rock show, pyro, lighting, video, huge show. Um, but they've got this really kind of like quirky idea that they want to do it in intimate coffee shops. And I know that you're all thinking that sounds ridiculous. Um, but that, that's the point of it's obviously not feasible. Um, so while nobody's, Green Day's never going to try to do a giant rock show in coffee shops, when you're thinking about the, is the idea feasible, that thing that kind of went off in your head that goes, that doesn't make any sense. This is kind of the nitty gritty of, of does that make sense? So the first thing that we're going to do is take a look at who is involved in figuring out if an idea is reasonable. And a lot of this is the artist's full-time team. So they're going to, typically an artist is going to have a manager. The manager is generally an ex, kind of an extension of the artist. They're gonna probably be paid a percentage of the revenue that's generated, very much a 24 seven job where you're bringing all of the puzzle pieces together. So it is not just touring, it is also um, recording, merchandising, sponsorships, all of the things that kind of go into um, what is the big picture of the artist's career? That's kind of the role that the manager is going to play. And ideally, they are thinking as though they are, um, you know, part, part of, the, they're the number one part of that artist team. So we're going to watch a little video. It's about five minutes uh, where we're kind of going to behind the scenes look at what it's like to be a manager. There we go. Infrastructure and creating opportunities. That's what managers do. The most interesting thing about doing management is there's really no such thing as a typical day. One day you could be waking up and going to a studio and working on music. You could be flying halfway across the world to uh, help supervise a festival. And then you could be on a photo or a video shoot working and making sure all the styling and the imaging and the cast flow and the time is all running on time. I view it as you're really the big picture strategist. You've got to come up with the long-term plan and goals and then sort of back that down into smaller, more achievable, manageable goals. I look at management as I'm overseeing all the departments, so I have to be a little bit of an expert in everything, but I don't have to know every single tidbit because I'm hiring the people to run those departments. Generally, you've got everyone. I mean, you've got the product manager and marketing team at the label. You've got publicists either like internal at the label or externally hired radio department. Uh, your publisher and your TV sync team. You've got there's your yeah, the attorney. Uh, there's just like a whole host of people. I guess as a manager, you're kind of just running point and making sure everyone's doing what they should be doing and everyone's communicating and kind of giving some directions so people aren't treading on other toes. The manager's connected yeah. to everybody. Like, we are the ones dealing with all the communication. The job of a manager is to supervise every single operation that happens in a band. If I'm doing my job right, we eliminate the problem before it happens. Being a manager is not something you can read a book and learn. You actually have to physically be in those situations and do everything. My entry was just like being a part of the community, like being involved. I think that's really important by yourself, like become an intern, like dig in and you might not get paid right away, but apply yourself. I think the most interesting thing about being a manager is that there's no one path that leads to it. Most people who I think are successful in management have a background and a history doing many other things. I would definitely suggest do not take on 100 bands. Like, find a few or one and focus on it. If you see things connecting with the one, then just focus on the one. 
don't spread yourself too thin because that that's a mistake and you will not be able to serve the artist well just get up there and hustle and like there's so much you can do by yourself i mean i started out as a photographer just like randomly emailing managers and pissing them off trying to get in and shoot their band and ended up on tour shooting books and you just gotta i mean you can whatever you want to do you can do you just gotta like get out there and do it just gotta have the motivation and the drive to do it and not sit around waiting for someone to come and help you your level of interest will take you wherever you need to go and you'll you know mother nature will tell you if it's your spot or not after time for sure it's that natural selection works really well Forming a team is crucial because what you want is when you bring each team member on, you really need those team members to have been to a place that you haven't been to before. Just to introduce you into these gates and circles and next levels where they've won and you've never even shown up at. You have to understand how things like publicity work, how the legal process works, how merchandising works, how touring works, how hiring crew works, how insurance works. There's probably a hundred different people that work with every band and the job is really to know what they do and who the right people are for that team. Each artist is very different and you know I don't feel that I need to be best friends with my artists, but I do feel like there needs to be a some sort of symbiotic relationship, especially when you're talking about the younger artists. I like, take a very like educational approach. I feel like if my artists are informed about how and why I'm making a decision, they can learn to understand how and why I'll be making future decisions. The difference between a good manager and a bad manager is I think the difference between being reactive and proactive. And it's one thing to sit there and address problems as things come up. And it's another thing to sit there and every day wake up and say, what am I going to do to help move this band forward? It's not a job. It's a lifestyle. Like, you've got to love this. If you do not like being talked to at any point in the day or on vacation, like, it's you've got to be open to just being there. And if you don't have that naturally in you, then don't do this job. All right, so that is manager. I Just give me a second. I want to make it so that I can see the chat. Um, sorry that the video is choppy um, and that the playback is bad. Um, that is just going to be a little bit inherent to this format. But like I said, um, I will also on my website have a link to um, the actual presentation where you can click through and you can see the videos uh, in their kind of like full, better uh, version. Moving on, so we've got on the artist team, we've got a manager, we learned about that. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, the agent. The agent is focused primarily on touring and of course works with the manager and the artist to figure out when touring fits into uh, the artist's career plan. They are really looking at booking gigs and are also paid a percentage of the revenue that they generate. It's very much a um, kind of an office job. Like whenever I see, whenever I'm working shows and managers are, are, I'm sorry, when agents are at the show for the day, they all feel like they can't get any work done. They would rather be at their desk with their office and the phone and their computer and their system and their process. And uh, I find agents seem to, work most efficiently when they're kind of in their office space. Whereas managers are on a different, um, their, their, day can, their days can be much more varied where one day they are on site, another day they're in an office, another day they're at a shoot like uh, Mike Kaminsky said in the video. So looking at the agent video, we're gonna take a look into what that job is like. Why isn't it moving forward? There we go. I feel a personal responsibility and obligation to these people. They've trusted me with their careers and their livelihood. And so it's important to me that, you know, I can deliver on that. I get asked this question by like family and friends all the time. Like, so, so what do you actually do? And I was like, when Jimmy Buffett goes and posts like a list of tour dates and it's like, yeah, like you're going to go see that in Concord, the Concord Pavilion. So you see the list of tour dates. Like, that's what I do. I organize and set up and route those shows. You know, like that's what we do. Start to finish, day one to day 30 or whatever it may be. We obviously book the tours. 
we're out there fighting to get festival dates. Uh, we're fighting to get the bands opening for bigger bands. Booking agent can be just a guy who bangs out dates and like an employment agent finds jobs for entertainers. It's coordinating and scheduling, you know, the artists' touring plans. We're getting ticket counts for the shows, so we're continuing to monitor how many tickets we're selling, where they tour, when they tour, how much they get paid. We spend a lot of time talking to the band, strategizing what the upcoming plans are gonna be, whether it's the next tour or the next two years. Also being a mentor to them as well, not just booking, but also being a friend and part of their family pretty much as well. A booking agent can be someone who strategizes, gets a little bit more involved, and tries to figure out how best to tour a band to grow their career or to maintain their career and maintain their income at, at a proper level. Internships at you know an agency would be ideal or working with a promoter on the other side of it, seeing what the promoter is doing and how they're dealing with the agents. Work in the mailroom, go buy talent at, at a little club, Get, get yourself known, make friends, and maybe somebody in a position to give you a job all of a sudden says, you know what, this guy's sharp, this girl's sharp. It's going to shows. A lot of kids just want to like email people and like you know, Facebook stalk people and Facebook message people about stuff, but you got to get out to go to shows. You got to meet people. You got to, it's about your personality too. It's about wanting to, I want to be an agent. Like this is what I want to do. That's what I did. You know, I was 17 years old and I told my mom I want to be a booking agent. Be an assistant somewhere, like work your way up. Like the more you're around this stuff, the more you're going to learn. This is not a thing that can be taught. I think the best way to learn is to just do it. It's maybe easier said than done, but I think, you know, finding that local band that you really believe in, that your friends play in, and offering to book them some shows and just diving in head first and trying to figure it out, that's going to be a better learning experience than any schooling for this job that's out there. You just have to hustle and hustle and hustle. You know, it's like you might not get the all-time low tour that you submit for, but maybe you'll get it the fourth time around. You know, you got to put the band's name in front of the agent and just just call it punishing. Just punish, punish, punish over and over and over. And uh, sometimes it clicks, sometimes it doesn't. Every agent has, a, I think, a very different style. Um, I know for me, I'm not the yelling type. I'm not super aggressive. For me, it's about building relationships and making people want to work with you. It's a, it's a negotiation and also process between the agents and managers, and that's the whole grind of being an agent is trying to get the most reasonable money for your client or the extra. As long as you have a great staff, you can figure out a really good system and be super organized, it's not that hard to take on a lot and still really cover all the bases. Um, but you definitely can't do that overnight. That's something that, you know, you have to gradually grow it so that you can actually continue to grow with the size of the roster and figure out how to continue to make your system more and more efficient. Two kinds of agents, really. Some agents have a great instinct for signing talent. Some agents maybe don't have that great instinct, but they know how to sell. They know strategy once they know what they have. Work ethic, I feel, is the most important thing in the music industry. You know, like you really have to be patient and be willing to grind and hustle for your artist, whether you be a manager or an agent or a promoter. Like, at the end of the day, it's like you need to just bust your ass to, to get to the light at the end of the tunnel. Our job, we represent talent. We represent these artists. We provide them a service and, you know, you know, we are lucky to be in this business, you know, especially if we love music. All right, and a third um, big component to the Is This Feasible team is going to be the business manager. So business managers can have a whole range of responsibilities. They might exclusively just be do tax preparation or bookkeeping. Um, frequently, business managers are CPAs, they're certified public accountants, uh, but when it comes to the is this feasible discussion, they're really going to advise on tour budgets and uh, help figure out if the idea makes uh, financial sense for the artist to do. 
And so how are they doing this? They're going to look at the revenue. What do we think ticket sales are going to be? What's merchandise sales look like? Are we going to be able to do VIP packages? Are we going to be able to bring in any sponsors or brand partnerships? So what is all of the potential revenue that this tour might generate? And obviously you want to be conservative when you are estimating the revenue. Um, and they're all, everybody's going to be looking at what are the expenses? We got this artistic vision of a giant rock show with, Lights, sound, pyro, uh, custom staging. How many people are we going to need to take on the road with us? How many people are we going to need at shows to build this every day? We need to rent all of the gear. Um, we're going to be on the road. How are we getting the people and the stuff from place to place? How are we feeding all of these people? How many miles are we driving? How much gas will we have to put into all of those vehicles to get around? What other things do we need to rent? So what are all of the expenses related to getting the show on the road? So looking at the uh, revenue and the expenses, and then also looking at the timing of the potential tour. So is there an album release coming up? Are we going to tie the tour in with that? Or is there any other kind of big media exposure? So typically you'll see whoever, uh, a lot of times whoever's playing the Super Bowl halftime show. Uh, in conjunction with that, around that timing, when they're having a lot of media exposure, you might see them announcing an album or a tour or something else. So if your name, if, if you're getting media exposure anyway, that timing might contribute to um, some touring decisions that you're making. So looking at all of, sorry, let me go back. So looking at all of um, those considerations, I think that we can pretty quickly go like, if. If Green Day wants to do a giant show, but in a coffee house, the revenue, we're not going to be able to um, sell that many tickets, right? A coffee house has maybe 50 people. Um, yeah, it's a small space, so we can maybe charge a higher ticket price because it's a more intimate experience. But that revenue is not going to cover the giant artistic vision of, that the expenses, the, and the expenses that will go along with that. So this is the point where some changes will have to be made to that artistic vision. Um, this is where the business manager, the manager and the agent are gonna say, you know what, this doesn't look like it makes sense to do this way. We either need to really scale down the production or we need to think about putting this in different, a different venue. Since Green Day has touring history of playing arenas, uh, it would seem likely that the historical data would tell us that they would be able to sell more tickets than uh, we would have in a coffee shop. So to make this a financial success with the artistic vision that they have, we're going to need to be, move this idea to uh, playing arenas. That way you have enough seats that you're selling uh, to bring in the revenue that can cover the expenses. So on the artist side, they decided that that is feasible. And this is the point where the agent then reaches out to local promoters uh, to say, hey, Green Day wants to go on the road. They're, gonna, they're planning this time frame. They are interested in doing arenas, big production. Uh, are you guys interested? So when I was a talent buyer, we would get that, about that amount of information. They might tell us some other things like what ticket price, how many trucks they expected the production to be coming in that would help us estimate some of the costs um, usually a time frame and any other specific parameters they had so then the talent buyers do the risk analysis they're going to take uh, the research search that they're able to do so what are the radio stations saying about are they getting a lot of requests for this artist um, what's the vibe from radio uh, how are the album sales? How are the streams and the listens? And really, we'll go back to, in a situation like Green Day, historical data. So using Polestar and All Access to look at how have the shows done in the past? What was the ticket price and how many tickets were sold? That's going to give a pretty good indication for what would potentially happen in the future. So taking all of that research together and then trying to look into a crystal ball to figure out what ticket price should we sell tickets at and how many people are going to buy tickets at that price. So that is the risk analysis that the promoter is doing to determine do, are they interested in taking a financial risk on the show. 
while they're kind of doing this research, we probably, the Green Day's agent has probably said, you know, this is the time frame that we're looking for. So the talent buyer is probably also reaching out to the venue, uh, the venues potentially, to see what dates would be available and put those dates on hold. So we'll talk a little bit more about this when we get into uh, our routing workshop. But if you were to look at, right now there's nothing on anybody's calendar, but let, if you were to look at a calendar in the past for say the United Center in Chicago, if you as a consumer go to the website, you'll see that there are basketball games, hockey games, um, Disney on ice or whatever it is that they're doing, concerts and other events. The things that you're seeing as the consumer on the website are the confirmed and on sale or soon to be on sale events. There is a whole separate behind the scenes calendar that uh, we call the avails. So what are the available dates? There are um, potential, and then you can hold an available date if you think that you're going to be coming through Chicago in a particular time frame. So let's say Green Day wants to play the, um, an arena in Chicago in the first week of May. During the planning stages, we don't know which date is going to be the date that makes the most sense compared to the other dates for Milwaukee and uh, Detroit and any other cities that are nearby. So you want to put a hold, which is kind of a right of first refusal on the dates with the venues so that as you're doing your planning, you have an idea of whether or not you would actually be able to secure that date. So we'll talk more about that process in our routing workshop. The talent buyers also figuring out what kind of financial deal are they going to offer. So there's two big categories of deals. There's a flat guarantee where it doesn't matter how many people show up, the artist gets paid the same amount of money, uh, whether 100 people show up or 10,000 people show up. Or there is a variety of deals that fall under the category of a percentage of ticket revenue. So the two most common that we see are the promoter profit deal and the versus deal. So this is what we will really get into uh, in the next workshop. We'll talk about how to calculate those. So what big picture, a flat guarantee makes sense if we cannot directly attribute the ticket sales to the artist. So cases like um, a festival or a fair, corporate events where there's not a ticket, or if it's a, if it's a headlining tour where there's a headliner and several opening acts, the opening acts are probably on flat guarantees. So in all of those cases, it, the band will get paid the same amount uh, without, it does not matter how many people attend the event, um, they will get paid what they have been promised. In the other cases where basically if, if it's a headliner that we know people are really buying a ticket to come see the headliner, uh, they'll get paid some percentage of the ticket revenue. So we'll get further into those details, but basically, if the, deal, the percentage deal makes sense if we can really tie the ticket sales to a particular artist. And if we can't, then it makes sense to offer a flat guarantee to that artist. Now, the amount of the flat guarantee is going to vary dramatically. So for the instance of the Warp Tour, where you've got 80 bands playing every single day, nobody's buying a ticket to the Warp Tour to go see one particular band. And if they were, well, maybe they are, but we wouldn't be able to tell which band they're coming to see. So all of the bands on the Warp Tour generally had flat guarantees, but the bands that are playing the main stage had a much higher guarantee for each show than the bands that were playing um, the smaller stages. So the amount of the guarantee might vary, but the number of people attending that Warp Tour date had no effect on how much the bands got paid. And then, the competition. So we have a bunch of uh, promoters that are doing shows in Chicago currently. Jam Productions, Live Nation, AEG, um, and then there's a bunch of upstart promoters in the last 10 years that, uh, or so. Um, they're all competing for the same Green Day date. So let's say in this case, Jam Productions and Live Nation both want to do the Green Day show, and maybe they want to do it at the United Center, maybe they want to do it at the Allstate Arena, but both of those promoters do shows in both of those buildings. So they are competing to win this date. What are some factors that go into why an artist would go with one promoter over the other? Maybe they like 
the ticket prices that the promoter has set. Maybe they like the expenses uh, related to the show um, that one promoter is able to do things more cost effectively. Um, how well does that promoter kind of have a grasp on the local market? Do they have the marketing reach to best draw um, fans to the show? Um, oh, going back to the revenue and the expenses, those two things, the ticket prices and the expenses, are going to have a big impact on how much the promoter can offer the artist for a performance fee. So sometimes the decision might be financially based on is the, how much can the artist get paid. Or there might be other considerations uh, like marketing reach or the history that a promoter has had with an artist. So it very much used to be the case before, before Live Nation was a thing and all markets around the country had a primary independent promoter. They, if you did a show with an artist when they were small, you then kind of had a right of first refusal. This is the polite thing. Um, a right of first refusal for future shows. So this really kind of encouraged promoters to take a chance on smaller artists and then know that they were going to kind of grow with them as their career grew. Um, with the advent of national touring, I think a, a little bit of that kind of changed where uh, the local, his, the history that a promoter had with an artist in a specific market um, sometimes does not play uh, the same role as it used to when promoters can buy an, an entire tour. Um, so that's competition between pro promoters. So who's involved in doing this on the side of the promoter? Who's figuring out this risk analysis and is, do we want to take a risk on the show and, uh, and all of this? So the talent buyer kind of oversees the promoter's involvement in a show. And loosely, we kind of call the company the promoter and the people that work at the company who are doing this um, are talent buyers and, or whatever other role, such as marketing director. But there's plenty of promoters out there where the promoter is a one-person show and they are doing all of the things um, that fall under the category of promoter. So a lot of times promoter and talent buyer, those titles are kind of used interchangeably. Um, so the talent buyers overseeing the promoter's entire involvement must love risk assessment and negotiation um, and will kind of oversee the once, well, I guess we get to that in a few slides. So we're gonna take a look at this video about promoters. Ideally, you find a band at a really young stage and you're able to book them in your small club and then you sort of develop them through your system and then they play your 1,000 seat club then you play your, your 1,500 seat club and they just sort of go up the ranks. And pretty soon, you know, in an ideal scenario, then, you know, that band grows and you're able to grow with them and you're able to help them grow. For a band to survive right now, like you have to look at the, you have to be able to conquer the country. And so you can only be so many places at so many times. So if you have a really good local promoter that's promoting your show, you're actually promoting your band as well. Typical day for myself at the office. Uh, it's a lot of talking. Uh, talking to agents and managers, talking to radio stations, talking to uh, bands themselves about opportunities, how we're going to promote, how we can grow bands in a particular market, how we can do shows bigger and better, how we can make it better for fans. So it's a little bit of everything from you know promoting bands and the marketing side to how we operate our venues um, and how we get you know the fans the best concert experience we can. Well, I'm kind of a one-person operation. I do all my marketing. I run my shows. I book you know, I'm the talent buyer, you know, so I kind of have to deal with every aspect of a show. I'm not a larger promoter where, you know, one person's booking the show, one person is running the shows, one person's marketing them, one person's doing press. Like, I kind of do all of it. We negotiate the rights to do a concert, and then we do everything we can to make that concert successful. So marketing, production, uh, you know, every element of it. A typical day, it's, it's more of a week thing because we start at the beginning of the week and I take the, the staff and I meet and we talk about all the shows that are going to happen that week. 
how we're going to handle because each show is different. We discuss how we're going to handle the parking, how we're going to handle the crowd, how we're going to make sure that everything fits. We do that at the beginning of the week, and then each day, everybody has to make sure that their job is being done, and I make sure if there's any questions or any problems, how can we deal with the best? Deal a lot with their booking agents. Um, a lot of times they'll come to us for avails and when they're routing a tour and they want to play a specific menu and so they'll come to us directly for those holes and we'll kind of fit them in wherever it works best for us and them to plan out their tour. Um, a lot of times they come to us with a, a band or an idea but they don't necessarily have a venue in mind so we work with them on the event and what we think is gonna is going to be most successful for the event. So there's a lot of influence there. We get to help out and kind of plan a really great event for somebody. We'll decide, we'll take a look at other shows we have on sale, when we want to go on sale, you know, what radio involvement is going to be, you know, digitally, where do, where do these bands live so we can focus on, on that area to help promote. And then they put together a marketing plan and ship that off to the, to the band's agent to sign off on. But you're guaranteeing somebody money and saying, you know, we're, we're going to guarantee you X amount. And then it's incumbent upon us to promote this show and, and make sure people show up to this, to this event. You're starting out in this business, pursue what you're passionate about. If you like being on the promoter side, you know, go find the best promoter and look for the job. And if it doesn't pay anything, who cares? Like in five or 10 years, if you're passionate about what you're doing, opportunity and hopefully money will, will come. Never think that anything's below you, you know? You really have to take whatever opportunity comes your way because you don't know where that next opportunity is gonna lead you. One of the things that really you have to be able to do is deal with people. If you can't deal with people in this business, you're not gonna go anywhere because you see the same people year after year after year. Pay attention, have a good ear, and work your ass off. And that's how I got where I was, it was like, I worked my ass off when I had nothing, and, you know? People respond to that. I started off at Coachella driving a golf cart. And I was like, that sounds like super fun, and I just wanna be a part of something that's so great. I don't care what I'm doing there. And from there, you know, I think as long as you can prove that you're a hard worker and have a really positive attitude about things and are willing to take on challenges in a positive way, then things will come your way, you know? The, the responsibility will always find you as long as you have a good attitude about it and a really strong work ethic. Because it's definitely not short hours in our industry. All right, so that's a little behind the scenes of the promoter talent buyer role. Uh, the marketing director at a promoter will likely also kind of be involved in the, uh, are we interested in making an offer on this and getting, uh, how, how well would this show do? So they have uh, the connections with the radio stations and other local media outlets to kind of get a feel for um, how, how the show would perform. So they're gonna advise on research at this point in the, in the process. Back up to the producer side where now the agent has gotten offers from all of the promoters around the country, all the, the potential dates that they might play in a certain area are on hold with the venues. So now they need to take a look at all of those offers and put together a routing that makes sense. So some considerations. Number one thing, which really I should move this to the first thing on my routing considerations list, uh, artist specific requirements. So is your artist only willing to or able to sing for a certain number of days in a row? Um, do they have a particular religious or other reason that they cannot play on specific days? Um, there was one artist that I was working with that didn't like to sleep on the tour bus. They wanted to ride on the tour bus and then check into the hotel and then just sleep in a hotel every day. So we had a limit on the number of miles that we could route in between shows. Um, you also have the logistics of the actual mileage in between things because you only have so much time between the end of one show and when you need to be at the next show. So like, can you get from point A to point B in the amount of time uh, allotted? Uh, days of the week. So obviously Saturdays are a great day to have shows. Mondays are 
the least great day. It seems like Mondays would be about the same as Sundays or Tuesdays, but people just kind of have something in their head that like Monday is just not a day to go out as much. So ideally you're not putting shows on Mondays and ideally you're putting shows on Saturday, Friday, Saturday, Sundays. Um, but that there's not a hard and fast rule on any of that. A lot of it also depends on a bunch of other factors. Um, like venue availability. So you really want to play the United Center in Chicago, but if that already has something booked on the day that you want to play there, you're going to have to figure out a different solution. So are you going to play on a different day? Are you going to play in a different venue? Um, so venue availability is certainly a consideration. Time of year, especially with the number of festivals that are happening there's kind of now festival season and a lot of the traditional touring as a result is taking place, is making a busy fall an even busier fall. Um, many festivals have a radius clause that says from a physical radius of however many miles, 150 miles from the location of the festival or the show, you as an artist are not allowed to play other shows for three or four months in advance and a month afterwards to avoid competition uh, and cannibalizing your own uh, sales. So because of those radius clauses, if you're a band that's playing festivals, you're not doing a lot of touring in those festival markets in the several months leading up to it. This has pushed a lot more shows to happening in the fall and the fall was already a busy time anyway. So this will be interesting with our new pandemic situation once things become open, venue availability and is gonna become uh, a challenge because everybody's gonna be trying to rebook their tours kind of on top of the same, in the same time frames. And competing events. Not only are you competing against other artists and other events that are of the same genre, but you are competing against just other things happening in the world. So like, for instance, Christmas Day is probably not a good day to hold a concert, right? But New Year's Eve, definitely have a show New Year's Eve. So uh, on the Warp Tour, we saw a huge decline in sales whenever we would play a show on Father's Day. And the reason for that was our the audience was primarily 13 to 19 year olds, which is an age range whose parents would still like them to uh, participate in family events on Father's Day. So we would, it, comparing a show from one year to the next, we would see a big drop off in sales when uh, it happened on Father's Day. So 4th of July, another example. Um, most local areas are having some sort of event with fireworks and the, uh, the and trying to draw a, a crowd away from that type of thing to a standalone uh, non-firework event, you know, there, you're going to have some competition there. So all of these things are considerations that go into putting together a routing that makes the most sense. Ideally, you're not backtracking, you're having the most efficient route from point A to point B to point C, um, but there's a lot of the pieces of the puzzle that need to come together to make that happen. So the agents figuring out the routing, getting approval from management and the band on all of this stuff. And then we're at the point where the agent can start confirming the shows. So they're going to figure out which offer they want to accept. Um, let the promoter know that they've accepted that offer. The next steps are plan the on, when is it going to go on sale? A lot of who should talk to who about things like marketing. Um, so a lot of introduction, introductions and connections for the other parts of the teams to be able to connect with each other to get the ball rolling on, on sales and marketing. And then the agency issues the contract to the promoter. So at this point, the big things for the show have been nailed down. We know the date, we know the venue, we know the ticket price, we know any relevant expenses. So anything related to the deal specifically has been worked out. Um, so that all gets put on the contract along with a bunch of standard issue language uh, that gets sent to the promoter and then both sides send it back and forth crossing off little nuanced details about whether they get paid in a check or by cash or by wire. Um, so a lot of legal things getting crossed off and rewritten back and forth. Um, as the, as the tour accountant, it's a rare occasion that I see an actual final completed contract with both signatures on it. I usually get sent some version that is 
the, the things that are relevant to the day of show are kind of solid, uh, but it's some in-between version that's usually not fully executed. So agent is confirming the shows with the talent buyer. Down on the promoter side, so now the um, show has been confirmed. The talent buyer can oversee the kind of three main departments that will be working on the show uh, leading up to it. And I, as I'm doing this presentation, I tried to put in a kind of a bunch of job title, not titles even, but a lot of kind of like, I want you to see how many opportunities there are for different jobs and careers within this that sometimes uh, are behind the scenes we don't think about as much. So on the ticketing side, there's a surprisingly large number of people involved in ticketing any show. So you've got promoter usually as a ticket manager, the venue's gonna have a box office manager, you've got um, people at the ticket company. Um, so making sure that the show is going on sale when it's supposed to, that all the ticket text is correct, that the prices are correct, that it's all built correctly. Um, all of that stuff's gonna be getting set up. On the marketing front, it used to be that out of the show budget, there would, there would be an advertising marketing budget. And traditionally, the promoter put together a marketing plan, got the agency's approval on that plan, and then went about executing that plan. And they were the ones to actually be doing the spend, spending the money on the TV, the print, the radio, street teams, um, outdoor advertising, like billboards. Um, since digital has become such a large element, I'm seeing a lot more collaboration between the promoters and the artist team. So promoters know what works locally. They know what else is being advertised in the same time frame um, in their local market. And artists know where their fans are living online. So artists really know what are the platforms, what are the, how do we reach the, um, the artist fans online. So I'm seeing kind of a lot more collaboration than there was 20 years ago. Then on the production side, you've got um, a promoter rep, who we also sometimes call a product, production manager. They're gonna coordinate with the artist and coordinate with the venue to provide whatever it is that is required locally for that artistic vision to happen on the stage. Um, and we'll get more into the advancing, advanced work um, a few slides down. On the, on the artist producer side, management's now going to be like lining up their tour staff and figuring out maybe some additional revenue sources. So on the tour management staff, you know, every tour is going to look different and different job titles might uh, from one tour to the next encompass different responsibilities. There's kind of three jobs that a lot of times can be done as one, the production manager, the tour manager, and the tour accountant. If all three of those jobs are done together, we usually call that person the tour manager. So on Warp Tour, the artists that were touring on Warp Tour typically had a tour manager that would also be doing the functions of production manager and tour accountant. So I'm gonna talk about the production manager and tour accountant kind of separately um, before we get to tour manager. So the production manager is who's really executing the artist's technical vision. And they're figuring out how to take the budget that they've been allocated. Um, and they're gonna maybe have feedback on if that budget makes sense or not. And can we do the artistic vision with this budget? Is, is, are these things gonna go together? Um, but they're gonna take the artist's vision of what's the sound, the lights, the stage, what the whole thing will look like and make that a technical reality. They're also going to be the person that creates the writer, which is a written document of what the production needs from the local uh, promoter to, to get this show on the stage. They're going to hire the vendors, plan rehearsals. When they're traveling on the tour, typically the production manager travels with the crew and they are getting the crew and the gear from point A to point B. 
a lot of the production manager work is done in advance. Um, ideally, there's been lots of conversations in advance, so the day of show, everything runs really smoothly. And I think that it's really important in this role to be able to be super organized and detail oriented and able to delegate. So having the, you know, the job is production manager, not production doer, I hear people say a lot, but being able to have the big picture umbrella vision for what are all of these things going on and how are they all fitting together, you have to be able to kind of like look at a big overview. So you've got sound, light, staging, all of these things, the production manager is bringing these different departments together into a cohesive um, production. So being able to kind of have the overview and be able to tie all of these parts together is really key. The tour accountant, in my personal opinion, the, the funnest job. Um, so you're kind of, the, the tour accountant's a terrible title for what this job is. Like I'm a tour accountant, I'm not an accountant, I don't have a CPA, um, I'm not doing any actual accounting, I'm not filing taxes, I'm not creating financial statements, and I'm not doing any bookkeeping. So what is it that I'm doing? Um, really I'm the on-site business manager. So I'm going to handle any cash transactions that need to ha happen physically on site. So payment of per diems, which is like a dollar amount that you get um, that kind of covers your um, travel away from home, work related expenses like eating, um, bus driver floats. Um, but the big thing that I'm typically doing is the financial settlement on behalf of the artist. I'm doing that with the promoter to get the artist paid for that performance based on the agreement that the agent and talent buyer had previously agreed, the deal that had been previously agreed upon. So most of the work that I'm doing as a tour accountant is in spreadsheet format. So I'm creating uh, spreadsheets and working with spreadsheets that then I send into the business manager who then puts it into the actual accounting system and does the actual taxes and financial reporting. So um, I do a lot of spreadsheet creation and work with spreadsheets but it's not within the actual accounting system usually. Um, and that varies for, from organization to organization. So if you have three people doing these jobs, the tour manager then typically is with the artist, getting the artist from point A to point B. So they'll usually travel on the bus with the artist, um, do whatever the artist schedule is. If they go to the hotel before they go to the venue, they would be along for that ride. Um, a lot of times on tours, the, once it gets a little bit bigger and you now have two people, a lot of times the tour manager will also do the tour accounting and the production manager does the things we already talked about as the production manager. So we're going to watch a little video on tour managers. These tour managers are all talking about it from the perspective of doing all three of these things together. Goes, I always tell my friends I want to do this. Hey, if you know a local band that's going out for a weekend, get in the van and go with them. See if you like it. You might be on the road for three weeks and hate it. Normal tour manager is responsible for all day of logistics. Go to production, sign up for press, get the set times, radio everybody. Feed them. I get them waters, I get them ice, I'm pretty much like the road mom. What time can we load in? What time can we park? How long can we park for? Take care of hospitality, get everybody their buyout, make sure the rider's all there. Make sure we backline, sound check, make sure the gear's all ready, get the guys on, get the guys off, pack the gear up. And then I settle with the promoter. At the end of the day, it's always getting paid. The biggest thing is organization skills. Um, as a road manager, you're basically just managing the lives of the people that you're on tour with. You organize everything they're going to have to do. You've known what they're going to do that day for weeks. And it's all about making sure that everything happens just right. I'd say 75% of tour managing actually happens uh, before you're on tour, if you're doing it right, in my opinion. It's just really overseeing and making sure everybody's doing their job, how it needs to be done and delegating appropriately so it can be done in the most you know financially viable and efficient way possible for your artists because at the end of the day you're also the accountant on the road making sure that they can make money and pay you
all the guys that I know that are really good and the guys that I've looked up to, guys that have kind of mentored me throughout time, have all, they all come from the same background that I did. And that was, that was very early on getting in the band and going on tour and learning it firsthand. Uh, the, the easiest route for me was just to work for Friends Band because it was just a foot into like a venue. The music business is very political. The hard work gets you a long way, but knowing people in the business is like any other industry in the world, really. Knowing people is what's gonna help you get your foot in the door and having the talent and the hard work and being able to back up people putting in a good word for you or whatever, being able to back that up with raw talent and hard work is a really positive thing. If you know friends, man, hey, do you want me to sell t-shirts for you for free? and just all hang out and sell your shirts? Or, hey, do you need someone to help set up your stage? You know, if you know anything about guitars or lighting or, or sound, then do that. And then the other side, which is what I did as well, was internet a venue. You know, if you have a House of Blues near you or a VFW, you know, just whatever. Hey, I'll work for free. Work for free, pay your dues, get, learn as much as possible. That's another thing that a lot of crew guys that are jaded and old frown upon is asking questions, but I still ask questions because I want to learn. You know, I don't want to be out here just doing the same old thing. I want to learn and, and be better at my job because I care about it. I think a good tour manager, you know, holds no bounds. And the bottom line, I always want to make sure my guys are really happy. At this point, I've now done every job there is in the touring world because I wanted to be a good tour manager. I wanted to have, an, you know, an overall encompassing idea of what needed to be done in everyone's department. I like to get really personal with all my guys because I don't want there ever to be a time where they feel like there's anyone else that they can talk to except me. Any issue they come into, I want to be the first person that knows about it because that's my job to handle it. Be willing to listen, be willing to learn. Can't be right all the time. I think for a tour manager, if you're timid, then you're, you're not gonna succeed, really. Um, you just have to believe in what you do. If you're a TM and Everything comes on you, right? So your merch guy's bummed, he's coming at you. Your tech is bummed, he's coming at you. The band is bummed about something, they're coming at you. If you're staying calm and relaxed and cool and collected, that's going to spread down, you know, I'm not gonna say rankings, but spread down the pyramid like that. If the top guy that's, in, that's gonna take the heat for everything can be relaxed, then it's gonna trickle down to everybody else. So why, why overreact and why get stressed out in a situation when you can just Figure it out. There's always a solution. Sometimes it's going to be easy. Sometimes it's going to be hard. But there's always a solution. As long as you keep that mindset with the, the PMA, positive mental attitude, it's going to show with everybody. When I'm out on the road, it's my job. Like, it's not a traditional job by any means, but I, I, work, I work my ass off. and I treat it like a job. Everybody has their own way of doing it. So just like the music is the art form, like my work is my art. So I try to perfect that and, and sell it to the point where people want that, you know? I hate to think about this as a job. It really just bumps me out. Like, when I'm ready for a job, I'll stop touring and I'll do something else and I'll work, I guess. All right, so those are some tour managers. Um, the next thing that is kind of happening once those key roles are put into place is lining up the vendors and the rest of the crew. And this can really vary so drastically from tour to tour on what's needed. Um, but we've got all of those kind of production elements that we talked about earlier. You're gonna have designers of those, you're gonna have techs that are executing it on a day to day. And then, um, you know, there's other roles that we kind of, I don't wanna say forget about, but um, that don't require technical expertise bus and truck drivers. I mean, I know so many people that got their start in this industry because they were willing to like drive their friend's band at night so everybody could sleep while they were getting there. Um, catering, restaurant world experience really can translate to um, on the road experience. So, you know, there's chefs, there's cooks, there's front of house staff. And I've seen a lot of, particularly the front of house staff that um, have transitioned that wanted to transition from the catering world over to the production world. Um, you can kind of move from running the front of house catering to uh, becoming a production assistant. Oh, I forgot I was going to zoom in on all of those. So those are some things. Ancillary revenue sources and also some on-site, on-tour jobs. Merchandise. So 
this is if you're a solo person doing this yourself maybe you're printing t-shirts in your garage and you're the one selling them at the merch table um at the show but maybe if you are green day and you are out on a big tour you're gonna have a merchandise company that handles the design the production and sending a merchant merchandise managers out on the road to uh oversee the execution of selling merchandise vip packages these become just everybody's got a vip package of some kind these these days um and it's really an opportunity to see for my really dedicated fans what as an artist what do they want to what experiences or things do they want that they're willing to spend a little bit extra money on and i can provide them something of value that matches that so there are companies out there that design the vip packages uh, is if it's something that involves a meet and greet or a sound check party or a barbecue with the band you're probably going to have somebody that's on the road um, staffing that to execute um, those on-site experiences but vip packages can be everything from get in early um, get some exclusive merchandise um, to a, a more acute an acoustic set or like i said like a sound check party or something and then brand, uh, sponsorships or they're really becoming called brand partnerships now um, a lot of times brands will have somebody if they have an on-site activation, they're gonna have somebody that's out on the road overseeing that activation. So people that are interested in getting road jobs but don't have technical expertise, the sponsorship, the, the brand VIP merchandise world, I see lots of people that from tour to tour jump between those uh, three jobs. They have a lot of the same customer facing, customer service qualities to them that don't require being able to like tune a guitar or know how to do sound. So we're still up on the producer side. Now the advanced work is really kicking in. So uh, ideally tours, a good tour day is like Groundhog Day. Everything should run the same way every day at the same time. And ideally there's not any hiccups or problems, but we know there's gonna be hiccups and problems. So we plan to have it be as set and as routine as possible so that their uh, only actual unique problems are the things that are needing to be dealt with day of. So how do we do that? First is knowing what does the tour require. The production manager is going to compile the rider, which is a written document that gets included with the contract or sometimes sent after or separately, that is going to outline what does the tour require for the show to happen, and then the promoter will take that information and determine what can the promoter provide. Um, a lot of times when we hear writers out in like the non-professional world here, we hear about you know what all of the fancy green M&Ms or the fancy steaks or you know all the, it's really catering related and that's just the hospitality needs are just really one aspect of the writer so the tech there's a technical section there's a hospitality section and a security section and then whatever other sections that need to be i'll usually try to get something included about settlement as the tour account and i'll put in there when you know that i am the person to settle with and this is when i'm looking to do it and then I'll usually have my own separate advance that I send out. But things like if you're playing an arena, they need to know where to build the stage in advance. What size should that stage be if the arena is building the stage? And what locations, how far from the back wall do they need to put the stage? Parking needs. How many buses and trucks are coming? And then the promoter will be able to determine, are we able to park all of those there? So a great example in Chicago is like the chicago theater it's right downtown you can put four trucks in the alley and you can park a couple of tour buses on the street next to it but in advance the uh we need to know what are we going to do with if we have more vehicles than that we need to have a plan for where are we going to park the vehicles if we can't do it on site stage hands when what time are they needed how many um security needs, dressing room and office needs. So kind of anything that, that the promoter would ideally be able to do something about in advance if they don't have exactly what is required um, will be in the rider. A lot of times this is followed up with a phone call, um, especially if it is 
a new promoter that the production manager is working with or a new tour or a new show, a phone call and really be able to talk through all of these details is gonna make for a much smoother day of show. So once the promoter, uh, the, pr the production manager has had that advanced phone call with the promoter, the promoter knows what they need locally. They're going to have the same advanced type conversation with the venue um, and go through the same things, find out what does the venue have that is required and what do, what are they, what do they not have? And then the promoter will figure out uh, how to source those additional things. So the tour requires a forklift, the venue does not have a forklift, now the promoter is gonna figure out where to run a forklift from. Um, so that is kind of advanced work. Now we move on to the day of show, frequently abbreviated DOS. Um, so I'm gonna talk about kind of like some, the four kind of like key generic times that things are happening through the day. The first thing we have is load in. This is what is happening to the venue, not what is happening to the trucks. You're loading the things into the venue. So in the morning, loading into the venue, um, who's gonna be on site? Ideally, your tour buses have all showed up and your tour uh, trucks have all showed up. So hopefully your touring staff is there. Uh, and the touring staff is really going to oversee uh, all of the technical logistics of the local stagehands to build the show the way that it needs to be built. So the local uh, venue and production staff and stagehands are gonna be there. Um, you might have some security on depending on uh, what, what the needs are. This is all very customized and all of this would be in the writer uh, from the production manager on who needs to be there at load in time. Also, what time is load in and, um, and that. So we're gonna take a look at a video that is on um, a festival production crew. So they are really talking very much more specifically about their work on Warp Tour. Um, but it kind of fits into the whole like production world. So here we go. I love what I do. It makes me happier than anything else in the world. But I've never been, a, I've never sang, I've never played guitar, I've never been in a band. And I'll stand up there with my guys and see 5,000 kids jumping up and down. It looks like a tsunami. They're singing every word. And my guys are stoked. And I've seen them come off stage crying because they're so happy. Generally, with the advancing of the show, what you do is think of all the elements that you need, labor, ice, catering, uh, fencing, water jumps, uh, medical, security. Everything they don't provide, you've got to carry. What a stagehand does is helps with uh, production, you help on the trucks, you help on the stage. Every morning, uh, we are out here at like 6.45, 7 a.m. setting the stages. Barricade, perimeter, and get the sound going. Back line, out of the truck, getting everyone's tent situated. A bunch of different VIP risers that we set up and have to break down. So it takes us roughly about, I'd say two and a half hours, maybe three hours to uh, get it completely show ready. Each guy kind of has their own world, you know, that they get accustomed to and they set up each morning. So between, we have myself, the stage manager, backline, uh, front of house, and a monitor guy. So each person kind of has their own world and we all go into our own mode. We get a couple of local hands that help us and we set up our own stations, which all intermingle to form the uh, pirate ship that we have going every day. do whatever the hell people ask of me. And I always have, like, I don't care. I don't mind hard work. I don't like waking up in the morning. You have to work. I mean, that's the most important thing. You always have to stay busy, ask questions. You have to be able to assess a problem area and jump in and help out because there's not always someone there to take the right. You gotta be a resource. You gotta, you gotta make sure you, you are that resource. Even if you don't feel like you are, you gotta make sure that you are. People, they'll, uh, they'll pay attention to that. You either have to have the answer or you have to know who, who has the answer. 
That way, you know, if you get asked the question, you can ask the question to the person who knows the answer. My whole job is communicating. My whole job is listening to the radio. I listen to every single thing. The radio is my whole job. Taking to a schedule is a big deal. All my bands know I like to start on time and to end on time. I just like to be on schedule. I don't like to be that dude that's not. Getting your foot in the door would be the kind of thing where just go to a venue in your local town and local hometown and just be like, hey, put me to work. I'll work for free and just start there. You know, being there and like you meet new people and you see what you do and you get to be like, you know, trustworthy and people like want to like to give you a shot. I went to the venue to get a concession job and I had a buddy that was walking out the backstage area. So what are you doing? He's like, I've got a job backstage moving gear. And I was like, you know, I kind of had an idea of what a roadie was, but I didn't really know what a stagehand was. And he goes, yeah, the locals come and they help the roadies. You know, we hung out a couple of days later and he gave me the lady's number. The production manager, I called her and I got the job. Busting ass for free for someone for a year doesn't, doesn't hurt. You know, do what you can. <laughs> There's different elements of my job that you can easily learn. And there's other elements that may take time. You know, you could learn by looking and seeing and asking a million questions. There are different people in every organization who some like to do this little bit of your job and some like to do that bit. So you sort of wedge yourself in and you got to fit in. So if you know all the jobs, it's really easy to pick up the bits that other people aren't doing or don't want to do. If you want to become a production manager, aim to become everything. Ah, Kerry Nicholson with our wise words of his wise words of advice. Aim to become everything. Um, after load in, obviously a lot happens to get everything set up, but the next kind of like a time check in the day might be uh, doors. So in addition to being the physical thing that opens, it is also the time that the physical doors open. So at that point, you're going to have um, the rest of your venue crew is going to be on. So you're going to have all of your box office people, uh, managers and sellers, ticket takers, ushers, merch sellers, concession sellers, medics, and your full security staff where all of your security positions at the venue are going to be uh, on at that point. After doors, we have the show, the reason we're all here. Um, that part is kind of self-explanatory, but usually the, the settlement, the financial settlement of the show happens usually while the show is going on. So typically the deals are going to have to do with how many tickets were sold and there's going to be expenses related to it. So once the box office is closed and we have all of the expenses, then the representative from the um, tour and the representative from the promoter can sit down and sort all of that out and agree upon how much the artist is going to get paid based on the deal that the talent buyer and the agent previously negotiated. And then after the show, we have load out. Again, what's happening to the venue, we're loading the things out of the venue. Uh, and you'll, at that point, you might have additional staff on site like uh, cleanup and conversion people for an arena. They're going to turn it from a rock show into um, a rodeo for the next day, or they're going to put, oh, I thought it was crazy when I first discovered that the basketball floors at arenas are not built into the floors. They're in like four foot by four foot sections. So if you have a basketball game the next day, they will bring the basketball floor out and set the basketball floor up. Or if um, the ice is in for hockey season, um, the ice stays in and there's just like a covering that goes over it. So they'll take the covering off or do whatever they need to do to turn it from an arena into whatever's happening the next day. Um, so then, you know, ideally you are on your bus by bus call, which is the time the wheels start rolling, not the time that you should start wandering towards your bus. And uh, if you are on time for bus call, you, uh, you're on the road to do it all over again the next day. So that is the overview of how an idea becomes a tour. And how do I turn my camera back on? Um, so thanks for sticking with me on that. Let's see, I think I had some Q and A's pop up. So 
let's see. First, we've got Faith asks, what would you recommend for high schoolers to do now before going to college for the music industry? Um, well, this will kind of tie into something that I like to mention anyway. I think in all the vid videos, somebody at some point mentions doing free work. And I think that that can be kind of, uh, I don't know, hard to decide what to do, how to do it or whatever. And should you be doing it for free or should you be getting paid? So for me, the free work that I did, um, I was at Jam Productions, I was in the accounting office and really, really, really wanted an on-site job where I was, I, I do not like sitting at a desk doing the same thing in the same office nine to five every day, like being out there. Um, so I went to our head production manager at the time and asked him if I could shadow him on some shows and uh, managed to talk him into doing that. And that led me to the opportunity to be able to learn how to put on arena shows from a production standpoint, uh, which was really, really valuable experience. It helped me learn that I did not want to be a production manager, exactly. Um, but when a talent buying position opened up, that put me in a prime situation where I had the accounting knowledge from doing the, the accounting side, I really understood the numbers really well, and the production knowledge to understood, understand what those numbers represented, it put me in a position where then I was hireable as a, a, a talent buyer without having previously had talent buying experience, exactly. So my recommendation on what can you do if you're in high school before you're going, you know, if you're wanting to get into it, there is no barriers to entry on a lot of stuff. You put on shows in your garage, right? For friends, uh, get involved in any sort. Live events, if, you, if you're interested in concerts, you don't need to just be interested in concerts. Any event that happens that people are coming to are gonna have the same production elements. So uh, local festivals, street festivals. Um, you know, there's a, the town that I live in, every Thursday night they close down one block of the street and have like a come eat from the restaurants and bring all your stuff outside. It has a lot of the same production elements that like a concert does. So any sort of live event, races, like a 5K or whatever, um, working on any of those sorts of things to get a feel for what type of thing do you like to do if you're an on-site person um, will help narrow down what it is you want to do and give you some experience doing it. It will also give you the opportunity to network pe with people uh, and meet more people to lead to other things. So as far as like free work goes and volunteer work, if you, you should be getting something out of what you're doing. So when I was uh, spending my free time on weekends, when I had a normal full-time job learning the production side, I was getting knowledge. At some point, if you are bringing enough value to it that you're, what you're getting, you've, you've learned how to do the thing, you should then be getting paid in dollars. A lot of this has to do with what, what are your life needs and, and whatnot. But if you are providing a service, you should be getting paid for that service. And, and, and this is, goes beyond kind of like the, there's technical things about internships and whether you get paid for stuff. But you, if you can spend your time getting paid in knowledge, that's gonna, if you have the opportunity to do that, that's gonna further you and take you somewhere. All right, Maddie asks, apologies if you're getting into this in a future session. In the manager video, it said that a manager should have an overview of the financial and legal. Do you have any advice on how to get clued in on it? If like me, you have no experience in this side of things. Um, well, finding people that do that, do whatever the job is and picking their brains is always a reliable way to go. Um, and even if that's a five minute conversation, maybe it's a 30 minute conversation, I learn just about everything I know by asking lots of questions. Um, while I teach a class on producing and touring live entertainment, that was not something that existed when I was getting started in the industry. So I had to, uh, you know, as I was working shows, I would just pick people's brains. Even if we're standing around for five minutes, hey, can you explain to me, like, why is that barricade called a blow-through barricade? Like, what's blow-through barricade mean? Oh, it means there's holes in it and the air can blow through it. Like, you just kind of ask questions about whatever is around that you don't have a lot of expertise on. So if you're trying to get into uh, the management side of things, um, find some artist managers and uh, that, that you can maybe pick their brains on some of the financial and legal stuff. Uh, hopefully my workshop series teaches you some about some of the stuff. We're definitely gonna get into the finances of putting on a show uh, and tour budgets. So my experience is very much on the 
uh, touring live event side. I'll be bringing in some guests that maybe we can get more into uh, things that are on the recorded uh, side as well. Uh, so that's my recommendation on that. What's your advice? All right, Stephanie asked, what's your advice on getting an artist a booking agent? Hmm. I will say that at some point I will have some booking agents on and we will ask them that question. Uh, I don't know that I have great advice on that other than um, the number one thing for any artist, you gotta have the top of your game, best product that you can. So especially during this time where everybody's stuck at home, like refine your craft. Your songs need to be not just great, they need to be amazing. If you're like really work on it, where if when we can go out and do live performances, like play live as much as you can. So getting yourself the experience um, to really like hone and refine your craft is going to make you a much more uh, desirable candidate for um, a booking agent. I'm also gonna say that in the, in the it used to be that like record labels were like the gatekeepers. They decided who are we going to put a record out, and now now the record label is going to tell the entire world about this band. Now it's become you're able to develop an audience, develop a following, and then you can take that to an agent and say, "Look at look at how we are growing. We are catching on. We are making something happen, and we're ready to take it to you know the next step. We need more professional representation." So, being able to demonstrate that your product is great and that you've able been able to grow a following, uh, an audience, I think is going to be good selling points for any agent. Someone an anonymous asks, "Is the manager aware of everyone who is working on the tour?" I mean, the manager should be aware because the manager's overseeing all of the things that's happening in the artist's career, but is the manager going to know the name of uh, the, a catering assistant? I, I, I don't know that the manager is going to specifically know all of the people on a large tour. A lot of times managers aren't out on the road day to day. The produ production manager will know everybody that's on the tour. The tour manager will know everybody that's on the tour, but um, I don't know if the manager would necessarily know, but a good manager is gonna have a pretty good idea of what's happening uh, on a tour. And Darren asks, will this lecture be online to restream? Yes, it will, Darren. Um, as soon as I get the Zoom recording, I'll put it up uh, a link to it. I'll put it on YouTube and put a link to it on jenkellogg.com. Um, are there any other questions that maybe we have? Nothing's really popping in. So I just want to thank all of you again for spending this time with me. I hope you got something out of it. And I'm um, looking forward to on Thursday, we're going to talk about deal structures for artist performance fees. I just want to emphasize, I think that this is one of the things that's really hard to find somebody to teach you out in on, on site in the real world is how to calculate um, a promoter profit deal or a versus deal. So I'm really excited to run through those calculations and talk about like what situations they make sense in. Um, so hopefully you can join me for that. You've registered for this series of workshops. So you only have to register once, pop in whenever you can. And um, if you can't make it, they'll be online. Uh, some of the upcoming workshops will have more uh, hands-on Things. When we're doing routing, we'll actually work on doing a hypothetical routing. Um, ne next time when we do the deals, we'll actually be like doing the calculations for the deals. And like any, uh, any most of us out there, we learned to, we all learned to calculate the deals by hand before we had spreadsheets and um, formulas in a spreadsheet. So next next session, we will be calculating the deals by hand, and then we'll kind of roll into some spreadsheet stuff uh, next week, and then um, get into routing the actual tour. So um, thank you so much for joining me today. And I'm going to say the same thing that I said that my very first class that I taught in Columbia in 2013 at the end of it, like, thank you for sticking with me on uh, my first time doing this experience. It is a little bit scary to put myself out there in front of you all. I'm a behind the scenes person and I just thank you for rolling with me on it and uh, I hope you enjoyed it and I will see you again soon. Thank you.